Thank you very much, Brian. Um, first, thanks, Brian, for the very generous introduction. Um, I am deeply honored today uh, to be able to share my research with the brightest minds of Texas. And I am also deeply humbled by all the fascinating talks uh, in Tamist. Um, today, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about uh, my research on mechanics and materials of biointegrated electronics. And um, when people, uh, I received a lot of questions um, when people see I'm working on bio-integrated electronics, but I come from the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, why you are there. And uh, hopefully today I can uh, justify my uh, employment in uh, this mechanics department. Uh, it's a highly interdisciplinary research. Um, so, uh, First, let me share with you some applications of bio-integrated electronics. Uh, we hope that it's not just wearable, it could also be integrated intimately with the body to essentially become part of you. That's what we mean by integration. And for example, uh, those are 24-hour heart um, hotter monitors for heart disease, and we hope to replace this kind of uh, uh, obstructive devices by the so-called epidermal electronics, which is essentially a stamp size tattoo like electronics that can not only monitor your heart beat, your uh, temperature, hydration, uh, respiration, and many other um, sensors can be integrated on this simple patch. And that, but that is still tattoo like, very thin, very soft. Another example is in human machine interface, HMI, that uh, it has been a long dream of human beings to be able to talk to the computers talk, talk to the brains, uh, computers or machines without a voice, like using your brain to talk like avatars. So um, w what if uh, you can also um, uh, get feedback from the machines using this kind of smart fingertips with uh, t electrotactile sensors? It can uh, mimic the braille pattern that can generate poking on the tip of your finger, not using mechanical bumps, but using electrical voltages. Um, in terms of in vivo applications like implantables or surgical tools, uh, we hope to uh, improve those monofunctional, uh, conventionally hard uh, uh, implantable tools uh, by those uh, stretchable, soft, and highly integrated sensors and treatment devices on one platform, such as this uh, instrumented balloon catheter. I'll cover uh, some of those aspects today. Uh, if you ask me as a mechanician, what is the biggest challenge in bio-integrated electronics? I would say it is the intrinsic mechanical mismatch between the soft, curvilinear, and dynamic human body and the hard, planar, and rigid wafer-based electronics. But I want to be very fair to this problem that to achieve this goal, mechanics alone is not good enough. Uh, we also need to find a material that has very high functionality, that is uh, um, biocompatible, but it also could be very chemically stable under a very complicated bioenvironment, and also a way to cheaply manufacture them. Therefore, I'm also going to uh, talk a little bit about materials in manufacture today. And I choose to work with inorganic electronic materials like silicon and metal uh, for the reason that Jim uh, mentioned this morning, that they are, have very high electronic performance and they are so well established in terms of pr properties and manufacturing processes. And, uh, but unfortunately, they are intrinsically brittle and rigid. And they are uh, intrinsically incompatible with biotissues to begin with, but we can engineer them. Of course, we also need a lot of contribution from electronics and information uh, in which fields I had the privilege to collaborate with a lot of fantastic researchers, but I am not going to talk about them today. So the focus of my talk today is really um, a little bit untraditional bioelectronics, which is from the angle of mechanics and materials. So let's begin by talking about flexibility. Uh, so most of you have heard of flexible electronics for the applications of uh, flexible paper-like displays or rollable solar cells or batteries, things like that. So uh, let me talk a little bit about mechanics without using much equation. Let's think about how we bend a material. Uh, the beam has a thickness of H. If I bend it into this concave shape, 
the bending stiffness, uh, which scales with the thickness cubed of this beam, um, actually uh, can be reduced by 16 orders of magnitude if I reduce the silicon wafer thickness from millimeter down to nanometer. All right, and this is about how soft it can bend. How about fracture? It is a very brittle material which ruptures at about 1% strain. Strain is a measurement of the intensity of this deformation. And here we know that we can use a very simple criteria that the maximum strain, which always occurs at um, the uh, bottom surface, if I bend it concavely, uh, it actually scales with the bending curvature and the thickness. Now, if I can reduce the thickness by uh, six orders, I can improve the allowable bending curvature by six orders, right? So here, that's why um, we know bulk silicon wafer is not bendable at all, but if you reduce the thickness further and further, you can achieve ribbon-like silicon nanomembranes. Those are still silicon, nothing changed about the material. Simply changing the thickness, you can achieve this kind of fascinating mechanical property in silicon. So um, this is, uh, that is about a monolayer, but in a lot of cases, flexible electronics uh, requires multi-layer stacks. We need to put dielectrics, uh, encapsulation, supporting. So it's a multi-layer stack. What happens there? Well, um, conventionally, the multi-layer stack has a similar material stiffness uh, here. And if that is the case, then if I bend this multi-layer again, I would have um, uh, tension in the bottom fiber and uh, compression in the top fiber. And actually, this uh, distribution of strain is a linear distribution from very fundamental classical beam theory. And uh, therefore, we would get one and uh, a single one um, neutral axis where the strain is exactly zero, somewhere in between the top and bottom, right? It's a linear distribution. So using this neutral axis concept, actually you can place all the rigid components like silicon, gallium, arsenide along this neutral axis and it will experience minimum mechanical strain. Does that make sense? So therefore, uh, we can build uh, flexible solar cells out of very brittle silicon that can bend it down to millimeter radius, okay? By just placing silicon along the neutral axis. All right, so this is well known and then, uh, people uh, fabricate inorganic flexible electronics using this concept. However, we were very surprised by a very recent experiment done by my collaborator at MIT, Professor Jie Junhu. So he also has a multi-layer stack and uh, he can embed a, a strain gauge in the bottom layer, okay? And then he can bend this bottom layer concavely and measure the strain inside the, the bottom layer, basically. Depending on the location of this strain gauge, um, sometimes he actually f measured negative compressive strain in the bottom layer, which is completely counterintuitive to classical beam theory, right? So we were horrified, like what's going on? And he double checked his experiment and he firmly uh, said that this is uh, what's happening. So uh, my group took this challenge and, and uh, analyzed the problem. So we were puzzled for a while and then I said, okay, why don't I just replace the middle layer? Because the middle layer is actually a very soft layer compared to the top and bottom layers. Why not I just replace the mid, and uh, by classical beam theory, uh, we know that uh, it is a linear distribution and the bottom layer, no matter what you play with the geometry, the bottom layer should be under tension, right? So, um, but because the middle layer is very soft, I said, let me just replace the middle layer with the softest material, which is air. Okay, so replace the middle layer, and now what happens? Look at this problem. Now it becomes two completely independent decoupled beams. Right? Of course, when you bend this kind of decoupled beam, each of them will bend by themselves and develop a neutral axis within themselves. Right? Actually, the neutral axis would place exactly along the middle line of those, uh, each of those layers. Now, uh, the problem is that I have a middle layer which is stiffer than air, but still much, much softer than the top and bottom layers. In this case, I would be able to perform both analytical and um, numerical simulations to show you that indeed within each layer, 
they have their own neutral axis. It's just now the neutral axis is a little bit shifted, not exactly at the middle plane like air case, but still they have their own neutral axis. And the position of the neutral axis depends on uh, the combination of the thickness and the uh, Young's modulus. And now what we see is that we can create multiple neutral axes within a single laminate, which breaks the fundamental limit of the conventional beam theory. And that means uh, we can also predict the position of the neutral axis. And the significance of the work is that now, using this mechanics understanding, I can build flexible electronics of multi-layer brittle rigid components within a single uh, laminate, right? By using alternating soft hard, soft hard um, uh, super lattice. All right. So, um, that is about uh, flexibility, but uh, we know that our bio tissue are not just flexible, but also stretchable, which is a bigger uh, challenge here. Initially, um, in early 2000s, the motivation for stretchable electronics is simply to make electronics like soft as rubbers and uh, fabrics, and, or uh, to make them conformable to a complicated 3D surfaces, or to mimic the uh, bio systems like this uh, compound, compound eye tunable lens. So later, um, uh, actually stretchable electronics have found their fated, uh, fated um, applications in bio-integrated electronics, such as those tattoo-like electronics, balloon catheters, and this three-dimensional hard sock. I will mention a little bit about them. So to achieve stretchability out of an intrinsically brittle and stiff material like silicon, I have to introduce a very interesting concept to you, which is called buckling or instability. Think about that you are compressing a very slender rod. All right? Beyond a critical point, the rod will bend and suddenly lose its capability of supporting the load. This is a, a, a very sudden um, event, and it's called buckling or instability. And think about that if this rod is the beam that supports our room, or that's the boom of this crane, or that is the road on 360, you will have a lot of catastrophic problem in civil engineering. And also, another instability phenomena could be the propagation of instability inside an offshore oil pipeline. The propagation of inst uh, the, the pipe simply collapse like this with a speed of 188 meters per second. So those are catastrophic failures. Microscopically, when you put a stiff membrane on a soft substrate, if there is any little perturbation of the deformation, you can achieve this kind of um, uh, wrinkling or buckle delamination, which can easily crack the brittle membrane. So, however, uh, if we become very careful and very skillful about controlling those buckling behavior, what you can achieve is this kind of accordion-like silicon nano ribbons on soft substrates. The buckling is very well controlled, and the, the, the formation of buckles and wrinkles would not crack the membrane. In addition, they actually offer you the stretchability by converting the bendability of small ribbons of silicon um, into a large end-to-end -end displacement. Of course, you can also build in-plane uh, springs we call meandering uh, serpentine wires. And in this case, while linear wires shatter very easily, uh, if you make the same material out of an S shape, they could be very stretchable. That is very intuitive to us. So if we look into the design of serpentines, we noticed that, uh, uh, just giving you a macroscopic example, papers are not stretchable. But if I cut papers into this S shape, I would be able to stretch paper by more than 100%. Now that I think I shrink my paper cut by thousands of times, and I re replace my paper cut by silicon, I would be able to stretch silicon. 
And uh, um, the Buckley theorem are uh, difficult. It's nonlinear equations we have to solve. The work is on the way. But uh, we have developed curved beam theories to first just solve non-buckling serpentines. We can solve the force that requires to pull this serpentine. We can also solve the strain, the intensity of deformation inside of this serpentine. And our theory has been uh, validated by numerical, uh, numerical simulation. And we found that our curved beam theory only fits well when it's a narrow ribbon. But when it's a wide ribbon, we have to go into more comprehensive elasticity theory to completely capture the strain inside those ribbons. And we have found some very intuitive answers to create stretchable electronics out of silicon. We want the ribbon to be very narrow, allowable by your um, manufacturing resolution, of course. We want the arms of the ribbon, which are here, to be long. And that would be a very large accordion, of course. It's more stretchable. And we also want the angle to be very, very large arc angle to be larger so that it's a more tortuous ribbon. Those are intuitive, right? But what we found something non-intuitive is that not all ribbons, not all serpentines are more stretchable than their linear counterparts. When you do the design, you have to be very careful. And it's good to know a little bit of this theory. So um, we also care about uh, what are the forces we need to stretch a ribbon. And our theory, along with the numerical simulation, tells us that we can actually drop the stiffness of the ribbon by uh, changing it from linear to serpentine by several orders of magnitude if you make the ribbon more and more tortuous. And that is a very significant finding because that explains how we can achieve tissue-like electronics out of intrinsically very, very brittle materials. Notice it's also a six order of magnitude difference in stiffness when we compare silicon with our skin. So if your devices are stretchable or flexible, they are still not good enough for bio-integrated electronics. Because when you integrate that with bio-tissue, you created an interface between bio and electronics. So from mechanics perspective only, there are a lot of things going on on the interface. Just from mechanics perspective only, uh, you can see that microscopically, uh, a lot of bio tissue, including our skin, is rough. Right? The roughness is on the order of several times of our hair diameter. So in this case, if your device is uh, thick and stiff, it will not be able to follow the finest wrinkles of the skin. And therefore, first, your contact area is very small. Second, it is very easy to have a lot of relative shear on the interface, right? That can create a lot of motion artifacts. On the other hand, if you can create tattoo-like ultra-thin, ultra-soft devices, which can fully conform to the finest wrinkles of the skin, we can achieve a lot of um, advantages, such as low interface impedance, high signal-to-noise ratio, and uh, much less immune to motion artifacts, which is manifested by this experiment, where we have uh, comparing conventional uh, flat electrodes and our epidermal electrodes placed on a human subject chest. When the upper body moves, we clearly see motion artifacts in the conventional electrodes, but nothing happened in the epidermal electronics. That is one of the biggest advantages of uh, uh, epidermal electronics. We have developed experimentally validated models to predict the degree of conformability. And we learned that um, if you can use a thinner patch, if you can use a softer patch, the degree of conformability would be the best. That's very intuitive. Also, if you can improve the interface adhesion between the patch and the tissue, you can achieve better, uh, better conformability, of course. But we do not want to use a super glue that attach an electronic patch on your skin uh, without being able to remove it when the task is done. So what are the possibilities of creating reversible adhesion that is very strong when it attaches on your skin, but it's very easy to peel off without damaging the skin? Well, we have got inspiration from the nature. Uh, we built, uh, in collaboration with Professor Dehong Kim at Seoul National University, we built those uh, octopus-inspired micro-sucker arrays on our tattoo patches. 
So we created those micro suction cups that um, are on the order on the order of a nanometer, um, like uh, micron size, and we have improved the adhesion such that the patch, even if it carries more devices and becomes thicker, it can still conform to the three-dimensional scheme model very well and achieve very high signal to noise ratio. And mechanically, we tested the adhesion of this uh, suction cup based patches uh, compared with uh, uh, flat patches and uh, patches with micro pillars inspired by gecko structure. And we found that the micro suction cup arrays can achieve the highest adhesion, whether it's uh, attaching on a flat surface or on a skin mode. And also, we studied the skin irritation effect by uh, comparing the number of scratches on this mouth um, uh, with a flat piece without any adhesive and with, compared with the hydrochloroidal adhesives used in medical tapes. And we found that those microsuction cups uh, uh, applies very minimum irritation to the skin. And when it's done with its uh, measurement, you can easily, very easily peel it off without damaging the skin at all. So uh, the success of uh, disposable epidermal patches heavily hinges on the low-cost manufacture. Uh, and uh, conventionally, we fabricate epidermal electronics using a technology co uh, called transfer printing. And we have to manually um, uh, take silicon nanomembranes, which are very, very brittle, from those donor wafers onto polymer sheets, and also transfer those uh, 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 patterned serpentine networks onto uh, conform, uh, stretchable substrates. This whole process is very expensive, both in terms of cost and time, and uh, also um, um, my students are not happy about it. That's the main reason. So to make them happy, I have invented a much simpler process that can achieve the same goal, which we now name it as the cut and paste process. So instead of using any vacuum deposition, I purchased metal coated uh, plastic sheets. And I can perform the free form cutting without any mask or stencil, just by a, a laser or a mechanical cutter. I can form patterns that I can simply remove the and uh, paste them onto uh, whatever uh, stretchable substrates you prefer. This whole process is completely desktop. You don't need clean room, you don't need a photolithography, a vacuum deposition, and uh, I didn't involve any kind of wafer process in this. Therefore, I, it is intrinsically compatible with the row to row process. And based on this invention, um, my startup company now can produce hundreds of those patches at very, uh, thousands of those patches at very low cost per day. And um, to illustrate to you the tattoo-like behavior of those patches, my PhD student really twisted my arm to show that this is a very um, soft, thin, and a lightweight and mechanically imperceptible tattoo-like device. That actually is a um, platform technology which can integrate multiple materials and multiple devices onto a single credit card size patch with antenna. Um, and we can measure uh, uh, from the heart, the ECG from the brain, the EEG from the muscle, the EMG, and uh, uh, we can integrate soft string gauges to measure respiration, to measure skin temperature, to measure skin hydration. And uh, many other sensors are still under development. So uh, let me give you uh, three more examples because I before I close. The first one is that in addition to sensing, we could also deliver signal to the human body through uh, uh, voltages. So this is a smart finger tube that can have this two by three array of pairs of electrodes that can deliver uh, uh, voltage under a certain frequency and that can create a sensation like mechanical poking but actually it is simply just electricity. And it is therefore programmable and very easy to achieve wearably. 
And uh, a second example is this uh, uh, conformable three-dimensional heart sock that has uh, uh, arrays of electrodes and pH sensors and string gauges attached on them. And it's op also optically transparent such that we can use it as an experimental research tool to study the three-dimensional um, electrophysiology of the heart and compare uh, our results very uh, favorably with the conventional optical method. But the opt optical method utilizes this uh, toxic uh, voltage sensitive fluorescence. But our sock is completely um, not, uh, uh, safe. Uh, the last example is a um, non-invasive, uh, is a minimally invasive tattoo, uh, um, minimally invasive balloon catheter that is used uh, for, uh, uh, that is going, traveling through the vein to reach the interior of the heart, for example. This is all the surgeon can see under, uh, in, uh, during the surgery under x-ray. But if we can instrument the balloon uh, with the multiple sensors and uh, uh, electrodes, now we would be able to um, first tell whether those balloons are in good contact with the tissue with those pressure sensors, and we can also measure in situ the temperature while the electrodes are ablating the tissue and to quantify the burn of the tissue in situ. So it's an instrumented balloon catheter which can expand by 200%. With that, uh, let me close my talk by telling you that um, I only give you examples within mechanics and materials, and I hope I have convinced you this is a very uh, promising area that demands the collaboration of multidisciplinary researchers, and we are very open for discussion, suggestions, and your help. And I want to acknowledge my group at the UT and my funding sources, and a special thanks for Tamist in, uh, invitation. And thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so um, in terms of the electrodes, um, our uh, signal to noise ratio is uh, on par with the conventional gel electrodes, it's around 10. And in terms of temperature, we're using resistance temperature detector, which is uh, assumed to be one of the, the best mechanism to detect temperature. And for hydration, uh, we compared with the 3,000 bucks uh, uh, corneometer on the market, and the, the results are comparable. Right, so uh, we showed a slide that for various things and wide serpentine, they do uh, buckle auto plane. That gives you extra stretchability, actually. Is this a concern for damage, say, in the depth direction of the tattoo? Or? That's a very good question. It could create driving forces for interface delamination. That is why we also want to improve the interface adhesion. 